Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today with a friend and portfolio CEO, uh, Santiago Suarez of Adi. Uh, Santi, welcome to the podcast. Hey Eric, thank you and hi everyone. Uh, Santi, why don't you give an introduction to what Adi is and what was the insight that inspired you to start it? Out of all the things you could have uh, been doing in fintech, why this? Absolutely. So just for everyone, Adi is the leading point of sale finance platform in Latin America. What we do is we finance uh, purchases at the point of sale, both in store and off and online. For customers uh, currently in Colombia, we offer loans from three to twenty-four months in a fully digital process. And the reason we started Addy uh, a little over fourteen months ago, so it's been quite a journey, was that we saw two great opportunities in Colombia. Number one, the opportunity to change the way people receive something as basic as consumer financing, which is something that people in the U.S. can take for granted, even in Europe. But in Colombia and in most of Latin America, it's incredibly hard to get credit, even if you're a creditworthy individual. And the second thing is we realized that we had a great opportunity of solving that problem by building a world-class technology company. And that's what we set out to do and what we have been doing since September of 2018. Let's back up a bit and, and talk about how venture capitalists have, uh, have viewed the space because while, while there's been some excitement, there's also been some skepticism and, and you were previously a part-time partner at Y Combinator, so, so you're, you're familiar with the investing uh, landscape as well. Uh, talk, talk about how the category uh, ha- has been viewed by, by VCs and how that's uh, evolved over time. Absolutely. So I think it's been a tumultuous love-hate relationship. And, and, I, and I don't think unjustifiably so. So if you look at even companies like Lending Club, which I spent some time in, um, I don't think they ever lived up to the promise that some people thought they would in the private markets uh, when they eventually went public. And I think the reason is, is that th- there is a view in VC that lending is a very hard business and is a very cyclical business. And I, and I think there are two, two aspects to that. Number one, it's a very hard business, as in actually figuring out who to lend to is, is not an easy job. And B, cyclical in that the moment you have a downturn or a recession, all these gains and traction that you have achieved can easily go away. It also doesn't help, uh, doesn't help that it's a not particularly high margin business, especially in the early years. So I think when you capture all of these things, uh, I, I, I actually think it's perfectly understandable and natural that lending businesses uh, don't get as much love as we lenders would like from from the VCs. One one VC, prominent VC put it. He, he said uh, the reason he doesn't like lending businesses is because they tend to be arbitrage businesses that are great during an easy credit market, but at some point that will reverse, and most of these upstarts don't know how to manage their downside. As a former, and, and this is a tough one, but as a former investor in lending businesses, I would have to agree with that statement. And something that we take incredibly seriously at Addy, and I was recently at a conference and, and I made this point where I said, I had never seen a company that had built a true long lasting valuable franchise doing lending alone. And I'm sure some read, uh, some listener on the podcast will probably say, you're forgetting about XYZ company. But I think by and large, that's true. I think lending, however, is a phenomenal, phenomenal customer acquisition tool. Because there are very few ways that allow you to acquire a customer and get paid while doing so. So as we think about lending, for example, Addy, there are two things we do that I think make it a little bit different than your average lending business. The first one, Uh, We try to manage our risk, and I know those are famous last words, so that we can be resilient in a downturn. But perhaps the more fundamental piece is that we're very well aware that lending for us needs to be our customer acquisition tool. It cannot be the business. So if you start thinking of lending as your business, I think the statement from these prominent VCs stands true. I think, however, if you see it as a customer acquisition tool, 
and you have a programmatic way of building relationships with your customers, uh, lending can be a tremendous first product. Have we seen businesses, or what are examples of businesses that have, have successfully used it as a as a first product? Um, and and how do you think about Adi in terms of what could be future products? So I think the most successful example of using lending as a first product is bank is traditional banking. So I know right now their brand is not as strong as it used to be. But for a while, Wells Fargo was the most valuable bank in the United States. And they were able to do that. And they were more valuable even than JP Morgan Chase on the strength of their consumer franchise. And they were incredibly well known for their ability to take mortgage where they were strong. At some point, one out of every three mortgages in the country was underwritten by Wells Fargo and used that as a way of getting the customer relationship in the door. The most valuable customer relationship you can get is the deposit relationship. The moment you have a depositor that is loyal to you, that's sticky to you, you don't even need to knock it out of the park in lending. All you need to do is deploy these incredibly low cost of funds in market-based assets. And that's, a, that's an incredible business. So as we think about Addy, and to answer the second part of your question, we take a lot of inspiration from the people that have built this incredible, sticky, loyal deposit and consumer banking franchises. And as I said, I think the best examples are Wells and, and Chase that has used, for example, their credit card, the Sapphire Reserve and the Sapphire Preferred as a way of bringing people into the, into the broader banking umbrella. And without giving too much away, that is not too dissimilar to the way we think about the Addy product roadmap, right? Which is we can give you a hand at a moment where you need it, where you want a fair deal, you want an affordable deal. And then we use that to start building a much deeper and longer relationship than just giving you a single loan and forgetting and forgetting about you, which is why we don't do white label deals, which is why we run our own customer service program, our own collections program. And it's all predicated around building a relationship with the customer from that very beginning. Why don't you talk about how you are or aren't uh, inspired by uh, Square and Affirm in, in the sense of w w what are they doing that's, sort of, that's, that's game changing and, and how do you think about that? So let's take Affirm first and I would start by saying that uh, we have a couple investors in common and we have a couple advisors in common. And I think Affirm did a, an incredible job at realizing that the ability of the legacy providers of merchant financing for the consumer to do this online was incredibly limited. If you think about ABS, if you think about Synchrony, uh, those people were totally ill-prepared to go online. And I think a firm saw a great opportunity to go in and build a consumer-facing product. So they actually make a point of having their brand, of building that relation with the consumer. Uh, taking advantage of a shift from brick and mortar commerce to e-commerce. I think they did that incredibly well. I think their UX is fantastic. Um, I think the way they think about increasing conversion and helping the merchant with that is very, very interesting. I think where we differ is that when you are in the United States, if you want to take that first point of sale loan and convert it into a longer term customer relationship, that's going to be harder. It's going to be harder because that person probably has two credit cards. They probably have a bank account that they may not be thrilled with, but they are probably okay with. So making the jump from I funded your Casper mattress to I want to be your, your top of wallet solution for consumer financing is a lot harder there. In a place like Colombia, where less than 15% of the population ha has a card, where it's incredibly hard to get consumer financing, and where banks are meaningfully less popular than in the US, you can start doing that. And you can start building that repeat relationship. And A, you have an easier time going into merchants, and B, you have an easier time going into consumers and actually building that relationship. And I think when it comes to Square, we, the biggest learning we take is how obsessed they are with the customer experience. And I would say one of our biggest advantages as we as we're in Colombia, and, and I think one of the biggest advantages you can have in an emerging market is bringing a square-like approach to product development. 
and think about all the little things that will make customers work with you, even if you're not quote unquote, the obvious solution. I remember when I, I was first told about Square in 2009, I had come in from two years in hardcore consumer banking and I thought it would never work. As I said, you're, they're gonna get charged a lot more than if they went to a merchant acquirer directly. But when it comes to ease of use, ease of access, the ability to take payment at the farmer's market, which at the time was revolutionary, that completely obviated the fact that you would pay 20, 30, 50 basis points more per transaction. And that is a lesson that I think is very important to keep in mind. It's very easy to forget that customers will pay more for a delightful product experience. Is, are the ways to differentiate in building lending businesses about you know, distribution, new distribution channels uh, and, and underwriting innovations? Uh, are there any other uh, measures to really differentiate? And then, and then uh, why don't you talk about how you guys think about that, uh, that Audi for you? So I think there are a couple of things. Number one is I agree with you, distribution channels. So if you have a proprietary distribution um, channel, you're, you're cooking with gas. Great example of that is Square Capital that lends to its own merchant base. And as a result, your customer of acquiring, your cost of acquiring that customer is meaningfully lower. Uh, that's why, for example, we love the point of sale lending business because we get paid by the merchant to acquire customers. And that's pretty nice. Um, I tend to be a little more skeptical of underwriting innovations in the US. I think in the US, underwriting innovations are harder to find. And what I mean by that is FICO does a fairly good job of predicting general credit risk and you have a fairly robust competition around identifying that marginal credit worthy customer. In part because you have a company like Capital One that is incredibly good at it and has incredible scale. And I think as you go abroad, the ability to have innovation around underwriting uh, models, but also just approach uh, becomes a huge competitive advantage. So something as simple as realizing that when you underwrite, you should focus on profitability and not loss mitigation wouldn't give you any advantage in the U.S., but actually puts you up, uh, sets you up much nicer in an emerging market where the local banking population and the local credit knowledge may all be around loss mitigation. I think the third thing, though, in addition to distribution, and underwriting is product. So can you deliver the money faster? Can you do it with less pain? Can you grab alternative sources of data, not so that you can underwrite better, but that you can provide a much better customer experience? That was the original Lending Club Insight when they launched. It was to be able to offer a personal loan online, no paperwork, and off you went. It wasn't necessarily at the time that you were getting tremendously better rates, but it was the difference between having to spend two to three weeks at the office with the bank versus having to be, uh, versus being able to go online. Of course, if you only have one of the three, it becomes a lot harder uh, to maintain and sustain a competitive business, especially because the fourth and most sustainable way of building a competitive lending business is having a proprietary and below market cost of funding. And that's where a lot of the, "Quote unquote fintech lenders that have emerged uh, have failed, and and so the distribution innovation is is through merchants. That's exactly right. And, and talk more about the the merchant value prop, uh, and then how do you uh, how do you acquire them at scale? Yeah, so think about it this way from the merchant value prop. One of the interesting things about the Colombian market, which is why we decided to start here, is that because consumer credit is so tight. Again, I, I, I am blown away by the fact that only 14, 14 and a half percent of the entire population has a credit card. And I, I used to joke that even I didn't have a credit card. It took me about 14 months of being here on the ground, working with people to eventually get a credit card in Colombia. When you have that situation, it's very hard for consumers to get financing for their purchases. So historically, what did merchants do? They offered their own financing programs. They work with mom and pop financing providers. So for the merchants, surprisingly, it's a much clearer value proposition than even in the US. I think in the US, you have to go in, you have to explain uh, why this is not adverse selection, why people can't use their credit card, 
why online is a different story, which is a lot of stuff that a firm has done incredibly successfully. But here, the pitch is a lot simpler. You need a bunch of people to finance. They don't have access to financing. We can get that done. And I think as, we, as we've been able to scale, uh, we've been able to go to well over 100 merchants with a sales team of about two to three people. And that's because the market demand is so big and the referral effect so strong that we have been able to get people all the way from Samsung, Telefonica, Huawei to mid-sized enterprises that just want a solution that work. And, uh, and that's been, I think, the key behind our ability to scale and scale very quickly. Yeah, you guys, is, is it uh, just over a year old? Uh, just The company is just over a year old and we have been originating a little less than 10 months. Wow. So it, it's been a whirlwind. Yeah. And uh, uh, what stats, if any, can you share about the, uh, the, the tremendous growth or, or product market fit that you've achieved? The, the team is almost 100 people, maybe more? What, yeah. Is- so, so a couple stats. Uh, so the team's a little over 100 people. In terms of uh, merchants, we're now live at about 150 merchants and 1,100 stores. Uh, we are also the only lender that does offline and online. So we enable our merchants to obviously go online. That's where the growth is. But over 95% of the sales are still offline and we're able to partner with them. And we have a little over 50,000 customers. Um, and so it's been, a, it's been a wild 10 months, I would say, from going from one store, one merchant to where we're ending the year with. What, uh, what, what can you say about what it's like to go from zero to 100 in, in one year? I mean, it's, it's very uh, uh, un- uncommon. How do, you, how do you think about the sort of extreme growth in terms of how you've up-leveled as a CEO or up-leveled your team or, or just any lessons for entrepreneurs out there who are, who are scaling, not as fast necessarily, but, but who are scaling? I, I'm very tempted to make a joke and say that I'll let others opine on the degree I have successfully upscaled. <laughs> um, so I will let others opine on the degree that I have successfully upscaled. But I think it's something that I think about all the time. And there are a few lessons that have come up that I never really understood when I was on the other side of the table, whether it was as an acquirer or as an investor or as an advisor. Um, the first one is you always end up working with the cards you have, not with the cards you want to have. I think a lot of the advice people will give you is, hey, map your org structure, figure out who the people are, and go hire them. And that is great advice, but that is incomplete advice. You also need to be able to work the business now. And for that, you have the people at the table, and you have the people you know you can get into the office for the next two weeks. And you have to make it work with those people until you go find that person. I'll give you an example. We, we found our new head of credit in London, uh, great experience, Capital One, Zopa. But that search took about six months. And in the meantime, the company couldn't stop and wait. They're like, well, we're not going to originate until we get this guy in the door. So instead, we had to be flexible and figure out, okay, how does the org structure look like and how do we organize ourselves and how do I organize myself to be able to get there? The second thing is the old Mark Suster advice, which I completely appreciate now, which is, hire fast and fire faster. Everyone always tells you, hire slowly, fire fast. Mm -hmm. And that's great advice in about 40% of situations. In about 60% of situations, especially when you're seeing increasing product complexity and increasing operational complexity, you just sometimes have to take a risk on an executive or you have to take a risk on a manager. And you know that they may not pan out. And that's okay. Because the risk to the business of not having someone work that sometimes is much bigger than the risk of making the wrong hire. And then the third thing is you have to avoid the temptation, and this is something I speak to my co-founders and the rest of our exec team all the time, you have to avoid the temptation of being reactive because it's so easy. Everyone that comes to the company on any given day can probably spend the day putting out fires and responding to email and just being in meetings that they need to be. And you have to be able to take out time and continue to build. So that balance between building for the future and responding to the short term is really hard. 
um, I think we have done an okay job or a good job at it, but you have to be incredibly deliberate about it. In both ways, by the way, I think we have found some people that love the building aspect of it, and then you have to remind them that they have to execute today. And then I think you find some people that are great tactical operators that can move the needle 20 basis points today, but the two or three months down the road have not really stepped out and said, okay, where do we want to, where, where do we want the business to be in six, nine, 12, or 24 months? The last thing I'll say, which I think is critical, is being very mindful about what culture you want to build and sticking to your guns and your strategy around culture. At the last Village Global Retreat, to give a shameless plug, that was probably the best conversation I had over the fire with a couple of the CEOs. We had three very different views on culture, but we all very much agreed that the right thing to do was having a clear view on culture and sticking to your guns on it, even if it meant sometimes your investors didn't agree with it, even if it meant you lost a great hire because of it, because at the end of the day, that is really what's going to allow you to scale a lot faster is for everyone to be marching to the same tune. What are some different views of, of culture that, that you've seen that, uh, that you respect, um, that you think you know, people do it different ways, but what are, what are a couple different uh, approaches? So I'll give you, I'll give you a couple uh, names uh, changed to protect the innocent. So uh, one of them is a Latin American unicorn in a highly competitive space. And they are very well known for their ability to work to the bone on a regular basis. And they hustle, they hustle super quickly, they move. And at the end of the day, I think they're tremendous at optimizing what the next 30 days come. And I mean that as a compliment, not as a, as a criticism. And I think they have completely up-leveled the expectation of what it is and what it means to work at a startup. And the best part about it is that those guys have that very clear. When you interview with them, they are very upfront about it. They'll interview you on a Saturday at 6 p.m. just to see if you want to, if you're going to be there and, and if that generates any noise. Uh, they'll call a meeting on a Sunday morning, not because they need to, but because it's part of the culture. So what I really like about those guys is in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment and in a region that has never had a lot of examples about hyper growth and hyper scaling, they were able to do that from scratch. And that's incredibly impressive. And the tempo at which they operate and move is also incredibly impressive. And they're able to iterate and outrun the competition on a regular basis. I think, you know, going back to the village piece, um, one of my favorite examples was a company that models itself very much along military lines. Talks about tours of duty, talks about troops, and they do it in an inclusive way, but they also do it in a very deliberate way. Mm -hmm. And they talk about taking the hill, and they talk about I spirit the core, and that is a great way of building common values, of building a common set of decision making tools, which to me is the most important piece. Is if you have the right culture and a common culture, people can make decisions a lot faster. This culture allows you to set boundaries, to set aspirations, and, and, and to enable people to know where they're headed without having to repeat that on a regular basis. And then in our case, uh, we tend to go more the hippie approach, if you will, but we're huge believers in conscious leadership and huge believers in the fact that we're running a five to 10 year marathon and what that means is we take very clear trade-offs in terms of our short-term performance um, because it'll be, I think, a lot easier in any given quarter or in any given sprint to work 80, 100 hours a week. But we believe that in the long term, by bringing tools like meditation into the office, by bringing conscious practices into the office, we're going to be more effective. And so far, even though we are a little over 100 people and we've been around for 14 months, we've only had one voluntary resignation to date. Um, so it's been pretty amazing to see the team stick through. And I think the savings, which are harder to quantify than the 80 hours, in terms of not having to retrain people, not having churn, having people feel like they are owners of the place and they're happy to come to work, have been tremendous. Yeah, no, I, I love the idea of having sort of an explicit mythology or 
or figurative language, whether it's the, it's the military or whether it's Buddhist principles or anything in between, because yeah, it allows people to opt in or opt out m much quicker um, and, and self-selects. Um, sort of be known for something or be known for nothing. Um, exactly. Uh, I want I, I want to go to uh, get get back to some some of questions about about lending. The um, cost of capital. Uh, how how do you or how should lending startups think about uh, cost of capital? How do they compete with banks if if their cost of capital is higher? How do you think about that? That is the fundamental question is for startups, for lending startups. I should say actually for any startup. I think we as a startup community can do a much better job thinking about the cost of capital. One of my favorite examples about lending cost of capital was about, I don't know, 10 years ago. And I was talking to a lending company CEO and I asked him what his cost of capital was. And his response was, it's zero because I lend out of my equity capital and equity is free because I don't have to pay it back. And to me, that was a great view of how we still didn't quite know that equity is the most expensive thing you can do. And an easy way to think about it without going to corporate finance is every time you sell equity in your company, you're selling billions of dollars of future cash flows, future dividends, or future participation at a gigantic company. So the way to think about this very simply and in a very caricaturesque way is let's say you raise money, $15 million at, I don't know, a $60 million post. So you just sold 25% of your company. If your company is worth $50 billion at some point, that is worth $12.5 billion to fund, I don't know, $10 million, $15 million worth of lending capital, minus losses and all of these things. So equity is very expensive. Now, you want to be able to, so, but there are a couple of things here that are very interesting. The first thing is, so equity is very expensive. So you want to start moving to cheaper and cheaper cost of funds. Obviously, the way to do that first is you get a debt facility from one of the private credit funds that will charge you very high interest, but it's again cheaper than using your equity. And it will allow you to scale and it will allow you to do that without overly diluting yourself and allow you to prove that you have a viable business model. In the US, you're usually not breaking even when you're doing that first credit line, just because the market's too competitive. And then over time, what you wanna do is start getting funding from banks, and eventually, I actually think, one of my kind of big theses of FinTech is that everyone converges to become a bank. Because at the end of the day, the cheapest cost of capital is deposits. Not only is it the cheapest cost of capital, but it's the only cost of capital that you could argue is below market. It's true franchise, economic value generating source of fund. So as a startup, I think you've got to think about very clearly, am I going to get to deposits? Eventually, by the way, you don't have to get there in the first three years or five years. You can get there in 10 years. But am I going to get to deposits? And if not, what is my angle that is so robust that I can credibly say I can generate above market economic returns without having a below market source of funding. ADS, great example of that. This is a publicly traded company. And what they do is they do private label credit cards with fancy retailers. So they have a lock in the distribution channel and they're able to issue the card in an exclusive way. But even them, uh, they have tried to look at, they have bought a bank, They've tried to diversify their funding mix, get some deposits in the door, similar to Syncree. So I think at the end of the day, you want to be looking for that proprietary source of funding, which usually has a deposit flavor. The one thing, additional thing I'll say about capital structure is that I think it's really important for not only VCs, but CEOs, but certainly everyone. I think you see this in the VC world. Some VCs will grab it. Some VCs will do much less investments in the area, sometimes get a bit confused, is that unit economics for a lending business begin and end with capital utilization. There's a very easy way for a lending business to have beautiful cash unit economics and beautiful LTVs over CACs, and that's if they don't, if they don't borrow money. Our biggest expense as a lender is the interest rate we pay to our 
own lenders. So as you think both from a CEO standpoint, but also as an investor standpoint about the viability and attractiveness of a business is not enough to think, are these guys making money on a unit basis? Is their LTV two or three or five times CAC, but what is their return on capital? How efficient are they with capital? And can they get to a point where they're generating attractive enough ROEs? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you get valued in the private markets. When you go public and the majority of your, of your book is a lending book, you're going to be valued off your ability to generate returns on, your capital, uh, on the capital you utilize. Let's go deeper on how uh, startups should be, th- fintech startups or lending startups should be thinking about balance sheet risk and, and capital. How, do, how should they be thinking about how to pass through loans? You know, raising capital to lend directly, what to do to get ready for that? How should they be thinking about balance sheet risk? So I would give you three views on that question. And with a big caveat that I have an evolving answer, and this is probably the most difficult question I deal with on a daily basis. So the first thing is you have to be lucky. Because I do agree with the fact that for a lending business to get going, it's useful to start at the right time. It doesn't mean you have to be at the right time forever, but it's going to be very hard for you to get somewhere if your first six to 12 months of lending are done in an environment where you cannot lend well. And by that, I mean control your losses, build scalability, and work with your customers. So I I also think that is true of most startups. Like you have to get the timing right and you could claim that you can do some work on that, but at the end of the day, there's a certain bit of luck. The second thing is balancing balance sheet risk and sell risk. So I think in Silicon Valley, and certainly amongst a number of investors, there's a big preference to have startups sell their loans very quickly. And I think by and large, in the very early days, that's a great alternative because again, the most precious thing you have is your capital and this frees up capital and it frees it up in a very nice way. So being able to think about how quickly can I sell my loans is a very good thing for most startups to do. At the end of the day, however, I don't think the answer is clear cut. And I've had this discussion both with and a fellow portfolio uh, company CEOs, uh, but also with fellow investors back in the day, because I do think that, to take an extreme example, if you are Wells Fargo and you fund yourself at 1% or 1.25%, and you have a book that yields 29%, and you're levered 10 to 1, maybe 15 to 1, why would you sell that book? That is the best business perhaps in history. I mean, it it turns out consumer banking is a great business. So I think as you grow and as you get scale, distributing your loans is a great strategy, but I am very hard, very, very hard pressed to find kind of a long lasting model where just distribution makes sense. And if you think about, for example, Capital One, they eventually went and bought their own bank because they realized they could make money obviously funding themselves in the wholesale markets, but also building their own source of funding. So maybe I'm a bit of a traditionalist in this sense, or maybe I spent too many years in New York working at a bank, but I think in the end, if you find a proprietary source of funding that is below market cost, that, is, um, that should be your end objective as a lending startup. Talking about lending startups, if we were having this conversation in, you know, 10 years ago, 2009, almost 2010, um, how do you think, you know, or we're sort of reflecting back on, on, that, on that conversation we would have had 10 years ago, what, what's been surprising? What, what has panned out that we didn't expect or what hasn't panned out that, that we expected would be a lot bigger? Uh, sort of re- reflect on sort of the broader, you know, startup lending uh, ecosystem. So I think the most surprising thing, which like most things in hindsight, is not that surprising, is that a lot of the lending businesses that gathered a tremendous amount of capital in the venture market didn't live up to expectations. Obviously, Lending Club, Prosper, I would put in there, On Deck, On Deck being a fantastic business and the way they've done the turnaround today, but it's not what I would think everyone thought they would be 
when they were gathering their Series B, Series A in 08, uh, 2010. And I, I don't mean to sound too uh, clinical about this because, again, I'm myself running a Series A startup. So maybe in three years' time, someone will say, well, what's not surprising about Addy is that it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'm a little cautious of that, but I think your question is a very good one because I think at the time everyone thought, oh, banks are going to get disintermediated borrowers are going to meet investors directly and that was not it was not to be i think i'm a huge fan of ben thompson and i think uh, consumer banks are probably the original aggregators they gather a bunch of people that have a little bit of money and then they find the people that need a little bit of money with a tremendous amount of government help known as uh, deposit insurance which means you go with people who are, want a safe place to put their money and they lend it in a risky way. So the first thing that I would say was surprising was that these companies that had all these promise uh, didn't go anywhere. Um, second thing that was not surprising, but it's always good to see is if you focus on technology and product and building a true customer relationship, you can do really cool things. And the two companies that come to mind there are Square and Stripe. I mean, these are product-focused companies building deep relationships with the merchant and taking advantage of a world where the incumbents were just operating with 1980s technology. And I would say the third thing, since it's always fun to do things in three, is that people are now realizing that the big pot in banking and in fintech, consumer fintech, is the deposit relationship. And they're going out of full frontal. So companies like Chime, companies like Varo, are companies that basically said, you know what, we're going to go for that core relationship, the true value generation, value generating relationship of a banking uh, of the banking market, which is the deposit relationship. And they themselves are following in the footsteps of N26 and Monza and some of these European folks. T talk a little bit about the. Or how do you think about the tension between whether going you or other fintech lending startups should go deeper with the merchant side in terms of payments and software or, or you know, triple down on consumers and offering more financial products or, or do you have to pick? Can you do everything? How do you, how do you, how do you think about that or how should people? So I think the worst thing you can do is not pick. So I think there's a temptation to do everything. And you start saying, well, I can do this, this, and this. And then I can also do these other five things in the consumer side. So I increase my value proposition on the merchant side and I increase my value proposition on the consumer side. And I just think that's very hard to do. I think the only company that I can think of, think of that has done that remotely well is American Express. That for the longest time had a differentiated merchant value proposition and a differentiated consumer value proposition. And even them uh, started to have some challenges around what they were bringing to the table on both the consumer and the merchant side. But I think that's probably the most interesting kind of historical example of someone that has been able to serve both markets deeply and aggressively. So I think you, A, you have to pick. And, and I think one of the biggest challenges is, is, is if you don't pick. And B, it's hard to say, obviously we really like the consumers, but I mean, with are going too deep into our own situation, fighting for the consumer is always harder the consumer banking market or the consumer financing market is just a lot bigger. So it naturally attracts more competition. And what you really have to have an honest view on, and this is something that as it relates to the Colombian market, which is a market that's pretty unusual and unlike the US, for example, or even Brazil or Mexico, is that it's unusual enough that we can see how we can build a relationship off the merchant point of sale channel. Um, but I think the biggest question for a lot of these lending companies or a lot of these POS lending companies is, can you build that? And if not, can you then become this all encompassing, all inclusive merchant provider, merchant services provider? But I think if you're gonna do that over time, you're probably gonna be gravitating towards becoming more of a merchant solutions company, which is great. And there are multiple multi-billion dollar companies that make a great living at that. But then you have to start thinking beyond the lending piece. So think about product, think about marketing, think about lending not just to the customer, but also to the merchant. And eventually you should even think about how you provide uh, a better payments experience for your merchant partners. So, so I think 
you have to be very clear. Probably one of the best questions an investor asked me once was, who's your customer? Is it the consumer or is it the merchant? And I think if you don't have that very clear, uh, you're going to have a tougher time building a large and exciting business. Yeah. We were talking about alternative, uh, you know, or, or we were talking about cost of capital earlier. I'm curious how, how you think about things like, uh, you know, ClearBank, which is trying to, um, you know, replace equity with with uh, lending for, for things like marketing spend in, in venture capital, um, or, or even uh, alternative finance uh, or you know arrangements um, like uh, or, or products like ISAs. It's interesting because I would give you two different answers depending on the question. So uh, Clear Bank, I think, is awesome. I think it's a great product, and I do think that we are probably overly indexed on venture, especially in Silicon Valley. Um, I, for example, think venture debt is an awesome product. I think a lot of companies would be better off raising a little less equity and a little more venture debt. And it doesn't get you the headlines. No one likes to say, oh, I raised this gigantic venture debt round from XYZ venture debt provider versus Sequoia or Andreessen or whoever, but it's much cheaper capital. And especially if you have a SaaS business or one of these recurring revenue business where you know you can cover the interest, uh, people should think about that. By the way, I think people will start thinking about it because the pendulum, in my view, has started to shift to sustainability, unit economics, and profits uh, in addition to growth, not in, instead of growth, but in addition to growth. Um, I think when you think about ISAs, that's probably the opposite piece. ISAs is much more like an equity product. And as a result, I think it's a more expensive uh, capital than if you got a student loan, for example. But the flip side of that is, depending on your risk profile and depending on your career profile, you can also arbitrage that. And I think at the end of the day, both ClearBank and ISAs are two sides of the same coin, which is basically kind of my view that we don't spend enough time thinking about the cost of capital because it's very difficult to think about it. It's very easy to think about the cost of debt because you're like, great, I got $100, it's 10% interest, I got to pay $10 back every year, and off you go. But cost of capital is a, lot, is a concept that's a lot harder to think about. So in the case of equity, people index over that because they're like, oh, equity, I don't have to pay back. Well, then I do, even though equity is much more expensive. And in the case of ISAs, um, student loans are very cheap capital if you're going to go become an investment banker, for example, because giving a share of your future earnings to someone when you know you're guaranteed to make half a million to a million dollars five years on the line may not be a great idea. But if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a creative artist, it's an awesome way of risk sharing the volatility of the career. So yes, I, I broadly agree that we should just be a lot more creative around capital structure than we currently are. Yeah. And do you have a sense for, you know, if five years or 10 years from now, we're, we're, we're doing another podcast episode, you know, what's, uh, what's a billion dollar company that might emerge in the ISA space or that might enable uh, ISAs? So if you think about the evolution and the great fortunes that were made in equity underwriting, and let's say, by and large, the emergence of the equity markets in Amsterdam and London in the 17 and 1800s and eventually New York in the 1900s are analogous to the ISAs. Uh, the people who made the most money were the underwriters. And not only the underwriters, but also the merchant bankers, who were the ones who not only took the underwriting piece, but also took the risk and then distributed. So with that paradigm in mind, there are two challenges around, generally speaking, these uh, equity, equity-like risk structures. Number one, um, aggregation of demand. So can you bring the people who have the tolerance, the appetite, and the term to seek out this type of risk? And then number two, can you give them a prepackaged product? So maybe the right way to think about this, and by the way, I'm so out of my depth, but this is a really cool question. But the right way to think about this is, can you build an investment bank for ISAs? And an investment bank in the 21st century Look, would look very different than the people in fancy suits. But basically, someone that does a couple of things. One, syndication, and the second, underwriting. So if I can standardize the risk of the product, and then I can figure out a way of distributing it. And distributing today looks, again, very different. It's not who you know, and it's not 
getting to the steakhouse. It's you can do this online, you can do this on platforms. Some people would argue you probably want to do it on a blockchain. Uh, but I think if you think about distribution and packaging, um, that would be where my money would go based on what I've seen be successful in similar kind of equity-like markets as they have emerged. And that would be a really cool problem to work on, by the way. Uh, I want to get back to something you mentioned earlier where you said you, you, your emerging fintech thesis is that everyone converges uh, to, to be a bank. How would that inform, let's say you were, you were focused on a, a, a fund, as a, a fintech fund that you were doing, um, and I know you do some angel investing with us. How would that inform your, your thesis in terms of what you'd be looking for or what types of new, what, what new types of companies would, you, would be on your radar? I would look for a couple of differentiators as it relates to these very specific question, only because obviously you want to find the right team on the right market and are you somewhat sensible about your spending plan? But putting those things aside that I think are very idea agnostic. Um, the first one is how can you become a top of wallet solution? So are you going to be building a tremendously close relationship with the customer, whoever your customer is? And I think, by the way, if you think about, not to pick on my old employer, but if you think about Lending Club, that's probably one of the challenges they face is that a one-time personal loan or even a two-time personal loan does not necessarily translate into a deep customer relationship. And if you don't own the customer, it's very, very hard to see long-term value. The second thing I would look for is, obviously the easy answer is, a company that has a credible way of saying, for this segment of the population or for this country or for this region, I have a credible way of taking that core deposit relationship. I can take many ways. I mean, you can just say, you know, the original point behind Simple Bank before they got sold to BVA was we want to give you an internet enabled bank account. Um, I think Chime has had tremendous success with let me get you your payroll two, three, four days in advance. We know it's coming. Don't worry about it. We'll give you that few days and we're good to go. Just move your payroll to Chime. So those are things that are credible ways of building uh, gigantic franchises. But, and if you recall, this is probably something you and I spoke the first time we met. I would also be very interested in people who are going to take much higher risk, but the bigger reward in supplanting the role of the transaction account and the deposit relationship in a customer's life. As you think about people building distributed networks, about people building cryptocurrencies, people building on top of Bitcoin, and I mean, this is all the stuff we've started to do at JP Morgan when we built yep, a right. forum on Ethereum. Why, why do we need to believe that the deposit account is gonna be the primary way of a random American consumer or global consumer to negotiate his or her financial affairs? And I'm not very creative, so I don't know where I would go, but I would be very interested in backing that team that has a view, no matter how crazy it seems, around disintermediating the checking account completely or the transaction account completely. Totally. And, and let's, uh, let's talk about emerging uh, fintech uh, or emerging markets. One is any noteworthy differences in the infrastructure between, say, LATAM and versus the U.S. as it comes to data for underwriting, whether you know, FICO, the plaid for bank connectivity and collections, what's easier there, what's harder? The biggest difference is that the infrastructure here is a lot worse. In general, there are always exceptions. So for example, in Colombia, bureau data is awesome. We have positive reporting, negative reporting, we get great scores or good scores, maybe not great scores, but good scores. Um, so you at least start with something. But at the end day, I think when you look at the very successful startups in fintech, Confio in Mexico, Nubank in Brazil, um, some of the folks like Alipay in China, these are all by and large vertically integrated startups. They do their own customer service, they do their own underwriting, they do their own product, their own marketing in a way that you don't really have to do in the US. In the US you can say, I'm gonna outsource risk and I'm gonna focus on distribution or I'm gonna outsource distribution, I'm gonna focus on product. And you can kind of pick and choose your battles. I don't think you can pick and choose your battles 
in emerging markets. Sometimes you have to fight every battle at the same time. So get your risk right, get your customer service right, get your operations team okay, and then eventually um, be able to build a sustainable business. By the same token, even though that makes it harder to get going, once you have something, um, it's a lot easier to build a moat around your business. Um, so you guys have experienced a tremendous product market fit uh, just, just in the last year. I'm curious, how, how could this work in other geos, uh, in other places around, like what would make a certain geography good for uh, an Audi like business versus, versus not good? Uh, how, how would you think about that? First thing is what is the level of penetration that regular banking products have? And if you think about particularly credit card acceptance, um, it's a huge indicator of the opportunity. I mean, there's this really cool company called Zest Money. Uh, it was started by the founder of Wanga. They just raised, I think they announced today, $15 million from Goldman Sachs to do a very similar thing to what we're doing in India. They've been doing it for a lot longer and they're incredibly good at it. So I think there are a few things that work really well. Number one, um, how available is consumer credit? Number two, uh, as companies shift online, how available is consumer credit online, which was a big insight behind, for example, a firm. And then number three, um, what do merchants want and need? And in particular, I think for this to work, you have to have enough of a consumer base that can get a little bit of leverage on their personal balance sheet and borrow money to buy, to buy a couple of things. So those are probably the two or three things that you would be looking for. And then are there people doing it? Because, I mean, going into Europe and competing against Klarna right now seems to me like a very tough thing to do. But if you go outside Europe and outside the U.S., uh, I think there's plenty of opportunity to do this type of business model, especially as e-commerce becomes more and more of a factor in emerging economies. How about emerging fintech more broadly? Like, you know, we're seeing, uh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people are trying to do, you know, Plaid for X in different geographies or, you know, new bank for X or um, how do you think about, uh, you know, taking business models globally versus, you know, new bank being the new bank for X or Plaid being the Plaid, the, the Plaid for X globally? You know, I used to be a lot more skeptical about the new bank for X and the Uber for Y until I spent time at Y Combinator. And then I realized that's a phenomenal way of quickly conveying your insight. So generally speaking, I would say, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to do those things. So if you think about Plaid, I think what they were able to do in terms of kind of ensuring everyone had access to everyone else's data and, and how they were able to go from kind of this guerrilla warfare operation of screen scraping to connectivity directly into the banks is an incredible example of how you take a technical problem because you need to understand the technicality of it to be able to solve it and build a multi-gazillion dollar company. That works only in the US, where the market for that service is so huge that you can build a multi-billion dollar company by serving other companies that want to be multi-billion dollar companies. I think the one challenge you have to face, and I think Nubank is a great example of how to do it the right way, is you know, Nubank has built a whole bank. They have a savings account, they have personal loans, they have credit cards. I think in the US, it's a lot harder to do that. So um, kind of to answer your question, love the Plat for X or New Bank for X, but I think as you go into emerging markets, you have to be, for better or worse, because this goes against a lot of the traditional Silicon Valley advice, you have to be a lot more expansive in your products, in your product ambitions. You cannot just build the API connectivity layer and pretend you're going to create a gazillion dollar business. I mean, if you think about probably the most successful startup in emerging markets, uh, Alibaba, those guys do everything. They do absolutely everything in a way that I think it's a lot harder to find in the U.S. A, that's a function of you usually have smaller markets, so you want to capture more of them. But B, uh, your competition is also a lot worse. You're not competing against Chase. You're not competing against Amazon. You're not competing against Synchrony. Uh, you're usually competing against local incumbents that have never actually seen serious competition and that may not be adopting technology and new practices as fast as you would, for example, as a new entrant. Are there any other learnings from your from your time at, uh, at Y Combinator or in terms of you seeing so many fintech startups come in, common mistakes that they make or things that they should be 
doing differently uh, or, or learnings that you had um, you know, to take it to Adi? You know, I think, and, and I think one thing is I have nothing but A, great things to say about the YC folks and B, uh, you know, part-time partner slash expert is one of the fanciest titles you can get when you're associated with YC given your involvement. So what, what it does mean is you work with a number of their portfolio companies. I think I probably work with over 30 of their companies, but you're nowhere near as involved as the people who are actually building and kind of growing what has, a, what has become an incredible franchise. So I just want to clarify that because I, I think it's, it's incredible what they have done. And I was really lucky to be along for the ride. What always struck me about YC uh, is the simplicity of their advice and how great it is. As a founder, it's so easy to get so convoluted and so complex and like, we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to move X and then I'm going to do that. And maybe 2% of the time, that's a useful mindset. Maybe it is true that you're facing a competitor and an external threat and they're going to come and get you. But 98% of the time, you need one metric, you need to think about the next 90 days, and then you need to think about the next 10 years. And you gotta figure out a way, and that is something that I think Tom Alban used to say a bunch, which is, what's your 90 day plan, and then what's your 10 year plan? And pretty much any other timeline at a startup, certainly at an early stage startup, is kind of irrelevant. Uh, I think once you get to you know a growth stage, and you have a lender, and you have a budget and all of that, maybe that's no longer the case. But in the first couple of years, 90 days and 10 years. So where are we going to go? And what do we need to do? What's the next step you got to take? What's the next step you got to take? I think trying to optimize two or three steps down the line is, is, is usually a waste of time. You change too quickly and you learn too much to, to think that what you're going to do, be doing in six to 12 months is, is knowable at all. My guest today has been uh, Santiago Suarez. Santiago, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. It's really been a great episode. Eric, thank you so much, and thanks, everyone, for listening. And, and, and for people who want to learn more about uh, Adi, where, where can you point them? Uh, www.addi.com. Uh, they'll find everything they need and more there. If you're an early-stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst.